Hello and welcome to episode three of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. We have 149 episodes recorded and available on YouTube, so if you miss out because of load shedding or your Tuesday nights have become busy, never fear, you can always catch up later. And uh, you may have noticed that I said we have 149 episodes. That is because tonight is our 150th episode. We have been blown away and so honored and amazed by the continued good response to the webinars. Um, I mean, who would have thought back in the dark days of 2020, we would have been continuing five years later. So I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the Conservation Conversations team, my co-host Andrew DeBlock, and the colleagues who uh, work behind the scenes to make things happen, Andy Wasong, Mpo Magidi, and Valerie Pakagao. And then also thank you to the rest of the BirdLife team, particularly Mark Anderson and Hanleen Smith-Robinson, and of course, all my colleagues who've come on the show to present. And uh, we've had some amazing presenters and topics over the years, so we must also thank all the other presenters without whom we wouldn't even have a show. Uh, and of course, I must thank Melissa Whitecross who started this whole uh, webinar series off. And finally, thank you to everyone watching and who has continued to watch over the years. Uh, you've been an amazing and loyal audience and um, we wouldn't be doing this without you. So thank you. And here's to another year of, of amazing webinars. So tonight, it, the webinar is about an event that was held in honor of another milestone, a significantly, significantly bigger one, the 75th anniversary of the Cape Bird Club. So we have Mike Buckham and Cliff Dorse joining us this evening to tell us about the Cape Town Big Year, which took place last year. Last year, as I mentioned, in honor of the 75th anniversary of the Cape Bird Club, they invited people to join them in a city of Cape Town big year. The instigators of this initiative were Mike Buckham and Cliff Dorse. And it wasn't just an excuse for them to get out birding and they had some great motives that they'll share with us. Neither of these gentlemen need much of an introduction as they've been on the show a couple of times before. Um, Mike is a fanatical birder in his words and a photographer who's been birding for about 45 years, most recently in the company of his son, son, Adam, who's developed a passion for birding and photography as well. And Mike is, of course, the chairman of the Cape Bird Club. Cliff is no less of a birding fanatic, in my words, um, but he's also branched out into all forms of biodiversity, so much so that he's made a career of it, having worked in nature conservation in the urban realm for the last 25 years. He is the head of the Conservation Services Unit in the city of Cape Town's biodiversity management branch. So Mike and Cliff, thanks very much for joining us. And uh, you may start uh, your presentation. Hi, Christina, and um, hello to all the listeners. Um, thanks once again for having me uh, to talk to BirdLife South Africa's members. Um, and yeah, it's very, very nice to be here and nice to be sitting next to Cliff. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Christina, and all the people that have tuned in to listen to us. Uh, it's really great to be uh, part of the 150th cons cons Conservation Conversation. So what an honor, uh, and thank you for that. It's great to have you both. We are ready to share. Um, yeah, you can, can go I ahead. Share? You should be able to share, but I'll just stop anyway. Okay, just give me a second. I haven't done this for a very long time. <laughs> Okay, um, just let me know if you can see the, the picture. Yeah, um, I can. Re recognizable um, photograph of Table Mountain and Devil's Peak. Um, yeah, so um, we're going to um, take you all through a few highlights. Sorry, I'm just going to turn off our video. We're going to take you through basically a, a bunch of highlights, um, uh, the reasons why we did it, um, how it all came about, how successful was it, and, and share a whole lot of pictures and, and stories from the challenge. Um, I think it was uh, way bigger than we ever expected. So let me uh, kick off. So um, as Christina, you mentioned, we celebrated our 75th anniversary uh, of the Cape Bird Club and I, um, as uh, someone involved in the committee and uh, a lot of the activities that we we're talking about doing during the, the 75th anniversary year, um, I, I really wanted to um, you know, do something that was really out in the field and took people out 
out of their lounges, out of um, you know meeting rooms, out of uh, halls, and go do as much birding as they possibly could during the year. Um, and so I met Cliff for a coffee, and I um, put the idea out to him. And, and bizarrely enough, he was considering launching something within the boundaries of the city of Cape Town. So a very similar idea. And it was quite serendipitous. And we, um, we both simultaneously said, let's do um, a burning video within the boundaries of the city of Cape Town. So that's kind of how it started. Um, and then it, it kind of gained momentum when we were putting together some rules and ideas, you know, in, in early and mid-December, we didn't quite know how much it would take off. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to emphasize participation, sharing the information. We wanted to get out to the city reserves and, and enjoy the birds. So the benefits are introduce new birders to the birds in the city, encourage the sense of community, which I think is so important. I think a lot of content um, on birds is available on social media, and we wanted to make sure that we um, got birders out there and, and sharing experiences, um, you know, face to face. Um, we wanted to um, encourage our younger birders to get out, and we, we also launched a mentorship program, which has worked very well in conjunction with the, the challenge. We've had some very keen younger birders going out there and seeing a lot of birds. Um, and we also wanted to highlight the city reserves. So Cliff's going to speak a little bit about that. Um, but we've got so many reserves in the city that uh, I think people don't really know about. And it gave us an opportunity to highlight that on some of our outings. And then um, one of the major, major factors, and we'll speak about data, um, was to collect data. Um, and I think um, Cliff has been handed uh, um, uh, a big wad of uh, um, rows of data. And he and his GIS team at the city of Cape Town and the biodiversity um, unit are going to be able to look at that data and see what it really means. And, and, and hopefully it will be valuable. So the area included was very simple for us to define. The city boundaries are, are obviously very well defined. So we asked um, uh, um, uh, Cliff for, for those uh, coordinates and we sent this to everybody and they could download it on their Google Maps on their phones. So they could have a very loud alarm bell ringing when they stepped outside the boundary. Um, and then um, we, we said, if you're standing anywhere within the city of Cape Town, you are entitled to log a bird. And uh, obviously, Hink was a big partner of ours during the process. He set up a, a challenge for us on bird lasso. And uh, if you joined the challenge and you logged a bird species, that, that piece of data would end up on, on the, the database for, for the challenge. And so um, that's how it started. And um, there was a real time view of, of data as we progressed through the challenge and people could see um, what was on a leaderboard. Um, and it created quite a, quite a lot of competitive behavior, but it was a great way to see the progress and, and also to encourage um, you know, people to get out uh, a little bit more. So we had some simple rules, any wild bird that you saw within the city boundaries, you could uh, log it. Um, and uh, just included some really cool wild birds. There's a central rock thrush on the left and a forest buzzard on the right. Um, we actually had a long debate about including some of our escaped uh, birds and um, the, the feral uh, type of species. And uh, we decided that these six species would be uh, tickable and largely to allow the city to understand where these birds have, have spread to. Um, we, we didn't know there would be a pair of black swans that would pitch up at Strunfontein. Um, so we had a lot of questions asked us why we couldn't tick black swans, but we had decided that they weren't included. And then if you heard a bird species, um, we, we were allowing you to tick it, and here's a photograph of a common quail. And I would suggest that there were not many people who saw a common quail during the challenge. Um, we said that if you were standing within the boundaries with a scope and you could see a seabird that obviously was outside the challenge area because it's outside the boundary, but if you could identify it and see it from within the boundaries, um, you could log it. So he has a, a southern giant petrel, and there's a bunch of us, that's my son Adam in the foreground, and a whole lot of very eager birders during a winter storm, um, looking out at sea in wild conditions, um, looking for seabirds. And actually, it's incredible the number of seabirds we actually did accumulate during, during the challenge. Unfortunately, none were particularly photographically um, appropriate to include you, except for that southern royal. And then we also said that we do not want birders to use playback. And the reason for that is we had a few sensitive bird species that we did not want to disturb. And um, a, a large component of that would be the, the fluff tails. We logged three fluff tail species, buff spotted, um, striped fluff tail. And, and this is a, a site for red chested fluff tail, which actually was discovered by Cliff. 
Um, this is at the Vitsans Aquifer, which is a, a reserve that's going to be proclaimed. This is a, a, an outing, and we were all hoping to hear the Dovetail call here. And unfortunately, on that Sunday morning, it didn't call. But we certainly did not want people blasting the call and, and disturbing the breeding cycles of sensitive birds. Um, we also um, said you must log bird species in situ. We didn't want any backdating. And then we said anyone caught climbing a fence or trespassing would be uh, banned from the challenge. And, and what you uh, can see here is I've just included a picture of Kuberg. Kuberg was unfortunately out of bounds almost for the entire duration of the year. And um, there's a big gap in our data for the, for the Kuburg Nature Reserve. And there was one Cape Bird out Club outing there, but it was a weekday. And unfortunately, there weren't too many people logging bird species. You can see there's one lonely dot in the middle of Kuburg Nature Reserve. And then we encouraged the sharing of um, sightings. We uh, started a WhatsApp group and we were warned not to. It would be unmanageable and it would be totally over the top. And people would be posting videos about total rubbish. Um, but we went against what everyone said and we made an open group and we, you can see I did this slip a couple of days ago, it's 313 members now. Um, we, we actually couldn't believe how valuable um, the, the WhatsApp group became just in terms of, you know, bird sightings, um, species identification, status of rarities and people were posting minute by minute updates. And, you know, it allowed us to also advertise um, the Cape Bird Club outings and get people out into the field. And uh, you could share your experiences and photos. It was almost um, a, a, like a, sitting in a room with a whole lot of like-minded people and just chatting about very cool stuff. Right, so um, that's kind of my intro um, as to how we went about it and what the rules were. I'm gonna hand over to Cliff because this is really his area and uh, ask Cliff to just talk about the city side of things. Thanks so much, uh, Mike. Yeah, so um, I just, uh, I can't miss the opportunity to promote Cape Town's biodiversity. I think towards the end of last year, or middle of last year, I gave a, a, a presentation uh, to a webinar to the uh, conservation, con conservation con conversations about Cape Town biodiversity planning in the city of Cape Town. So if you tuned into that one, you would have heard a lot of this. But I'm just going to quickly recap. Um, so Cape Town is amazing. Uh, we have unique and very special biodiversity in our city. Um, it is well noted to be the most biodiverse city in the world. Um, it is also one of only 36 global biodiversity, biodiversity hotspots around the world that have been recognized by Conservation International. And biodiversity hotspots are those areas with very high diversity, very high endemism, so the species limited to that area, but also under immense threat. So we're one of 36 of those around the world. We have 20 different vegetation types or ecosystems in Cape Town. So that's a vegetation communities, which are unique, 20. 11 of those are critically endangered. Um, so more than half of them are critically endangered and ad additional seven are, in are endangered. And seven of them are found nowhere else in the world, but within the city boundaries. So we have seven vegetation types or communities of plants that are only found in the, in, in the city. So they can't be conserved anywhere else. Um, and that's a huge opportunity, but it's also a massive challenge. Um, within all these vegetation types, we have over 3000 plant species, and that is huge. So it's one, it's a six of South Africa's plant diversity in less than 0.1% of the country's surface area. So a really high density of species um, uh, diversity here on the southwestern tip of the, the famous biome. Um, we have unfortunately lost 190 plant species. Oh, sorry, we have 190 plant species that are locally endemic to the city. So they don't occur outside the city boundaries, only within the, the city. Um, unfortunately, we have 660 red list plant species uh, or plant taxa, and 405 of those are threatened with extinction. So a lot of these are threatened. And we've already lost 49 species um, in the city and 14, 14 of those are, are globally extinct. Um, so a really lot of threat here. Um, but coupled with this wonderful botanical diversity, we also have really good uh, faunal diversity. We have a ritual mammal fauna. Um, frog uh, diversity is impressive, including four endemic frogs. There are four species of frog on the Cape Peninsula that are not found anywhere else in the world. For, in, for a city to have endemic vertebrates is, is very special and unusual, and we have four here. And we have lovely reptile and invertebrate faunas. Invertebrate faunas are still not well known. Um, and then, um, of the vertebrates, 52 species are of conservation concern and 29 species are threatened, it includes quite a few birds. And uh, we have a Ramsar site, we're known as a Ramsar city, that's a, a um, wetlands of international importance, three world heritage sites and three biosphere reserves in the city boundaries. Okay, just a map showing the 
uh, extent of the indigenous, uh, the 20 uh, uh, vegetation types or ecosystems in the city. Um, the one on the left is a historical uh, distribution and you'll see the mosaic there, those different colors, that's 20 different veg types. And on the right is what's remaining. So the white areas on the right map are what's been transformed through urbanization or agriculture. And you will see that the Cape Flats, the lowlands, have been heavily transformed, and the mountains, the Steenbrass Kofferberg Mountains, um, and then the Cape Peninsula are largely intact. And then we still have some nice lowland habitat up in the north around Atlantis and Silverstrom Strunk, but the lowlands heavily transformed, and that's where a lot of our rarity and, and endemic plants are. So, uh, um, and this was a subject of my last talk, um, at the conservation planning. So we have a systematic conservation plan in the city called the Biodiversity Network or Bionet. Um, and that looks at the, what sites we need are protected and what sites need to be protected to meet the um, national conservation targets for those vegetation types. Um, and those are the red blobs. The red and yellow blobs on the map need to be green. And uh, that's one of uh, the city biodiversity management branches roles. And my role is to try to get those red and yellow blobs to be green on the map. Um, it includes a 10 kilometer buffer to ensure that there's uh, connectivity and uh, uh, interchange and, and uh, with the surrounding municipalities. And we've also in the recent rerun of the Bionet included the strategic water catchments for the city, because uh, while they're out of the city boundaries, we are dependent on the water. Okay, um, so of the biodiversity network in the city of Cape Town, um, we have 55,000 hectares that are considered protected. Um, that's 65% of the bionet. So there's still 35% of um, area out there that's actually needed for national conservation targets that we need to conserve. And that's one of our challenges. And then over to Mike again. Thank you, Cliff. Um, right, so, I mean, large part of the challenge was to assist the city with uh, bird distribution data. I mean, obviously we couldn't necessarily help with a lot of the other um, in, uh, vertebrates, but um, we actually had a mammal count going as well, which is quite nice. So uh, that's, that's been recorded. I don't have any slides of any mammals, um, but yeah, so we had over 300 birders entered and participated and participating. And I, I think that was considerably more than we expected. We obviously had the 300 birders on the WhatsApp group and quite a big overlap there. We had some birders on the WhatsApp group who weren't participating in the challenge. And then I think there were very few birders on the challenge um, who weren't on the WhatsApp group because they were too scared they'd miss out. So, I mean, the big number is obviously the, the total number of species we recorded during the year, it's 324 bird species. And, it's absolutely incredible that we got that number. We didn't think we'd reach 300. Cliff and I spoke about between 280 and 300, not with a lot of scientific uh, thinking, mm. but we really did find uh, a lot more birds than we expected. And I think it's a, a large part of people being out there and, and actually participating in, in field birding. So it's 37% of the species recorded in South Africa um, in, in, a, in a tiny, relatively tiny area. So, I mean, this is also another uh, an incredible uh, stat. We had eight national rarities during the year. Um, so there might've been people who actually flew to Cape Town um, to see the national rarities. And some of them even joined the challenge while they were here for a couple of days. I actually know one particular person who did that. Um, we had 32 regional rarities or scarcities. And that's a phenomenal number because I think I personally added about five Western Cape birds to my Western Cape list, which is quite amazing. And then we had, um, 56 endemic or near endemic species. It's a bit vague as to how one defines endemic and, and near endemics, but we certainly had 10 of the 18 South African true endemics um, recorded during the challenge. So it really, um, uh, if, you, if you lived in Cape Town for a year um, and you were a birder, you would have had a, a, a hell of a lot of really good species to add to your list. So the data was incredible. Um, we got uh, down, downloads from Henk every month and I put together some summaries and just, it was incredible to see how the data grew, over 230,000 records across every corner of the city. So we visited many reserves, um, some reserves have not yet promulgated, but this data will hopefully encourage um, the, the powers that be to, to pr promulgate those reserves. Um, and we discovered new burning sites, so gardens and parks, and um, there were places that I think Cliff knew about, but a lot of us didn't, and we'll come to one of those in a sec. So this is just um, the, the species, the, the, the records per month. So one would obviously expect when everybody was raring to go on 1st of January, um, January, there were 45,000 records logged. Um, we, we started to get concerned that there was a bit of challenge fatigue in, in June. Um, so we launched what we called the Spring Boost and we had two competitions running during Spring Boost. 
and it worked amazingly well. Everybody went out there and just went flat out again. And it wasn't only number of species, it was also just log your records, just give us some data. Um, and then uh, in December, we had a really nice uptick from you know the um, birding big day that BirdLife South Africa runs and Ernst was very supportive of us and we just piggybacked on top of his uh, platform. And um, we had about 20 teams, which I think was probably double the number of Cape Town teams that we normally have. And it's quite interesting to look at the December records. So that's the number of records logged during December. And you can see on the 2nd of December on Burning Big Day, there were over well, almost 6,000 records in one day, which is just uh, amazing. Um, so here's just uh, from a, an individual perspective, these are our, our top challenges during the year. And I'm gonna count them from um, sort of uh, bottom to top. And, and so Zoe is one of our uh, amazing young birders. She's 16 years old and she went flat out in the challenge. That's her little chart. Um, that's a progression during the year. So a little bit of a slow start in comparison to some of the others, but she got 292 species uh, in the end. I think she came sixth. Um, Jacques Milan, um, he had a much faster start than she did. Um, Simon was uh, a very consistent competitor and um, was always the first to arrive at many of the twitches. Um, I was trying to shake him towards the end of the year. And every time a rare bird was found and I I thought uh, there were a couple of birds that I found towards the end of the year and he was there within minutes. So Simon had a, a GPS tracker on I think every single bird in the challenge. Um, and then Greta was our top uh, female competitor. She got 296 species and uh, very, very close to 300. Cliff was um, a dark horse. Uh, he was away for large parts of the year. So 296 was amazing. Um, I was determined to beat Cliff and I failed dismally. Um, so this was just the run into the very end of the year um, in December. These are the, the, the various challenges. And you can see that uh, Greta flatlined because they went away um, and not literally flatlined. She flatlined her, her birding records. Um, but uh, you can see Zoe was, uh, was charging at the end of the year. And it was about here on the second last day of the year that Zoe overtook me. And um, I was very, very happy for her. Um, and then uh, back to the main chart. And there's Michael Mason. He was one of two birders who, who broke the 300 barrier. Um, he, he wondered at one stage if we get to 300 and he got 309, which was incredible. Um, and then obviously, I think everyone will have known and have guessed that Trevor was our, our uh, birding big year challenge champion um, with an incredible 314 species. So he missed out on nine species. And what is uh, really, really notable is that he um, did not add any one of the last six new birds for the year. Um, and you can see Michael had a really good uptick. There were some good birds and we'll come to those. But um, I, I did ask Trevor if he would have flown back um, from Australia where he was holidaying and uh, having a good time with his wife, Margaret. Um, and I think he was tempted if he got a little bit, if Michael had got a little bit closer, I think there would have been a flight booked at the last second. So those were the individual uh, challenges and that's, um, you know, those are the guys at the top, but it was much more about participation and data and logging and, and, and learning stuff. And, this is a, a little um, app that I use to, to put all the data into and show where all the records are. Each of those colored dots is a different species, so it's a bit messy. Um, so that was all the records, and you can see we just had enormous coverage. You can see the Kuberg gap over here, and there are a few gaps where there are some areas that you don't really want to go birding. Um, but aside from that, we covered the area very well. And this was our most prolific birder. So um, <laughs> Michael Mason um, <laughs> logged 22,000 species during the year. So that's 10% of all records logged. Um, he had a special mount in his car where he tapped as he drove. Um, well, he tells me that his son tapped as he drove, um, but yeah, amazing. And those were all the birders that added uh, a lot of data. And we, we're very grateful for that. This was Michael's bird lesson map. As you can see, those little pin drops look very, very busy. Um, and what's quite noticeable, he sent a message to the group saying he's logged his last bird, a spotted thickney. And I'm a little disappointed. At uh, eight minutes past six, there is still at least two and a half hours of light in Cape Town. And I'm quite sad that he gave up so uh, easily. <laughs> right, so I'm just gonna pass on to Cliff. Um, I, I asked Cliff which bird species of conservation concern and interest uh, did he wanna highlight a few of these little maps? And uh, he gave me a few species names. So I'm gonna ask him to talk about one or two of them. Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah. Um, so it is a lot of data and it gives us a lovely opportunity to really look at fine scale at bird distributions with, within the city of Cape Town. And we know 
for a long time, uh, you know, grab access to colas occur there, nedikis occur there, but not there. Um, and it'll be quite nice to interrogate those records. Of, uh, there are some records that need to be cleaned up. Um, it was a black, um, there was a black harrier over Claremont and maybe Claremont. the Mitchell's Plain right? We, we might need that's to- That's over, over my house. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Mike logged that one. We'll have to interrogate <laughs> that later. But um, so if the endangered species, the threatened species, should I say, and the black harrier obviously is a charismatic bird, a beautiful bird, endemic bird, and uh, also endangered. So um, in terms of our protected areas, um, they nest on the ground, they're sensitive, they need big areas. And we need to look at areas in the city where we can protect species like this. And it would be a nice keystone species. If we can conserve habitat for black harriers, we can conserve a habitat for a whole lot of other species that need big, uh, big natural areas. And as is expected on the West Coast, some records around Bloberg, but then by far the majority up around Atlantis, um, uh, Witsant's Aquifer Nature Reserve and Silverstrom Strunt. And that's where we are busy with a very big uh, conservation planning in initiative with Cape Nature and other conservation partners uh, called the Dustenberg Catchment Coastal Partnership. We want, we want to create a protected area of about 25,000 hectares. So, so the same sort of size as a uh, Cape Peninsula National Park, the Table Mountain National Park. So these kind, these kind of informants are really valuable to us. Um, if we want to have these animals in the city into the future, we need to conserve the habitat. Um, the uh, black, uh, southern black Koran is another uh, very um, uh, uh, special bird, obviously endemic, um, almost endemic to the fangbos biome actually, it just goes into the, the succulent crew as well. And uh, from Sabbath 1 to Sabbath 2, the species reporting rates uh, have decreased hugely, and it's because they don't like habitat transformation, they, they want at least some intact natural veg. And as we lose the lowlands, we're losing the species. So really important to see where these occur in Cape Town. Again, Mike Lock seems to have logged one, a dodgy <laughs> one in the south there, but we'll have to go through his records. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the ones on the Tigerberg, maybe they're valid. We need to go look at that. That, that would be new information to us. But again, Atlantis, Witsuns, Marmory area. Um, so from a conservation planning perspective, it's a lovely bit of data to put into the process um, and a very special charismatic bird we need to look after. All right, I'll quickly talk about um, Fembos button quail. Um, I think it was one of those birds we certainly didn't want playback use because it's quite sensitive while it's breeding. And it was also a bird that um, I think we all really wondered whether we'd see it uh, in the city of Cape Town. Um, and um, one of my highlights of the year um, early, I think it was late January, um, I love running um, on trails and I, I went for a run in Silvermine East, um, which is uh, around about here. Um, early one morning and I was running uh, along a, a path and I, I managed to flush not one but two um, Fangbos button quails. Um, they flew nicely in front of me, got amazing views um, and I, I was super excited. I, I wrote a nice long message on the group and I, I thought this is going to be a blocker for the entire year. No one is going to see a Fangbos button quail other than me and literally the next morning um, Trevor and jo um, Trevor and, and Michael Mason and a couple of others went to Solaris Pass um, and uh, found this one walking along the gravel road. So um, it kind of squashed my enthusiasm a little bit, um, but it, it, it gave rise to a new site that we now know about where Fainbos button quail is, is actually quite regular. And throughout the year, there were people seeing Fainbos button quail at Solaris. Um, we had actually birds that were, were seen walking along roads in Cape Point uh, Nature Reserve. Um, and I think it's, a, it's one of those species that um, was one of the conservation stories, mm -hmm. I could call it, that we found new sites for a bird that is really, really hard to find for, for many birders that come to mm -hmm. South Africa and want to see our endemics. And classified as endangered currently too. So that was a pretty exciting bird. And then maybe Cliff, just talk about uh, secretary bird. Uh, another one, not not uh, also a threatened species, a nice big charismatic bird. And uh, although it doesn't necessary, necessary, necessarily need um, intact lowland vegetation, it does need big open areas. So um, the agricultural areas in Cape Town, um, as a blend with the natural areas and the nature reserves, we also need those agricultural spaces to remain open into the future if we want to uh, conserve thing, uh, things like the secretary bird. So I think these are always, I always get excited when I see one within the city boundaries. And it was great that many people observed them. And it's probably still only two pairs, um, if that. But uh, it's great to know where they're hanging out. And in terms of all sorts of um, uh, planning, it's nice to know that, that they are in those areas. All right. And, and then I just thought this was very interesting. So of these, um, of the uh, alien species that we decided to include, bronze mannequin, there were, there were probably about 10 birds released in Rosebank. 
probably 10 years ago. Um, and it was interesting to see where they were recorded and it's still very much dominating the eastern slopes of Table Mountain in the, in the southern suburbs. They haven't expanded, but they are becoming very numerous and probably competing with birds like sweet waxbills. Um, mallard's been here for many, many years, um, so quite widespread. Uh, peafowl, um, just I didn't say at the beginning, we didn't include Robin Island in our city boundaries uh, for the challenge. We didn't want people to have to spend 800 Rand getting on a ferry to go and tick two plastic birds. So we excluded Robin Island, but we said, if you see a peafowl, um, then tick it in, in, in the spot that you see it. So you can see they, they dominate in the Constantia area. There's lots of feral pairs there. Um, we didn't have anyone recording a chuckle partridge though on the mainland, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Um, and then rosy faced lovebirds, um, there, there are many hybrids, but there are quite a few that look relatively purebred. Um, and they, we said, if you see a lovebird, just log it as a rosy faced. Um, and uh, so there's still, um, there's a lot of uh, expansion in rosy faced when you're in the Durbanville area, you tend to hear them a lot. And then red headed finch is another bird that was obviously released from a cage and is now starting to take a bit of a foothold in the, the Durbanville Tigerberg area. And then this was, um, <laughs> this was on the second last day of the year, I think, or the third last day of the year. Um, a good friend Ian Raystack was um, in the, the waterfront in Greenpoint and he, um, he saw this uh, common miner. Um, and it's uh, probably a ship assisted bird, one would think, because it's right next to the waterfront. Um, I asked Ian for um, a photo, I asked, asked him for his photo, and he said, are you going to be presenting this photo as the least popular bird um, during the challenge? But um, I think fortunately it hasn't been seen again. I think Ian was the only guy that uh, logged it. Um, so that's, that's a relief, maybe a car ran over it. Um, but we, we do need to watch these things. We've got a house crow problem. In fact, that would have been a useful slide to, yes. to put in, is yeah. to see where the house crows are because that's starting to become problematic. All right, so this is a cumulative species per month. So you can see, um, I've obviously locked off the first 250 because it doesn't show that well, but uh, 276 species just in the month of January. And this illustrates the laws of diminishing return in any birding challenge. It obviously gets harder and harder to see birds um, as you go through the year, but still to get to 323, um, you know, it's, it's quite a, an enormous number. This is, um, the reason I included this slide is I want to focus on on these birds because they, they're birds that tell a story because they generally the more difficult birds. So in the last uh, four months of the year, we, we, well, we obviously had no new birds in, in August, uh, a very uh, dry month from a birding perspective and a very wet month from a climate perspective. But we had nine, 14 new birds from the 1st of September. You may not think that's a lot, but when you're doing these challenges, it is actually a lot. So let's just run through them. Some of them have got a story. Some of them are just birds that were found. Jacques Malan found this bird um, in, in literally the last 100 meters of the challenge area in, in uh, just north of Marmaray. Um, and uh, I think many, many birders connected with it. We, I went a few times with my son and uh, he missed it every time I saw it once when he wasn't with me. Um, so that was a bone of contention. Um, Matt Arolovitz, um found this uh, red knot um, in, on probably the worst weather day we had all year. And um, I jumped into his car, he called me, he said, listen, I've got a red knot and I happened to be close by. I jumped into his car and we spent a while trying to see this bird and get a photograph to confirm its IDs because the weather was, was pretty miserable. Um, and then on the same day, I, as I was leaving the works, I, I managed to find a, a lesser striped swallow and it, it turned out to be the only lesser striped swallow of the year, which was quite interesting. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, the Laidlers, um, uh, Dennis and Giggy found this red fellow rope at Um And it was an interesting bird because it only had one foot. Um, so um, one wonders uh, if that's why phalaropes uh, swim around in circles, this one even more so than others. And then this, this one has a bit of a story. This, um, um, we, were, we were doing some birding in the sort of um, uh, Philadelphia area. And we were, we were, I was birding with my son and a couple of friends and we knew very well that there was a carload of challenge birders who had made the very poor decision to spend their morning up at Feltriff, birding outside the challenge area. And um, we stopped at what became known as Pratt and Cole Dam because Trevor found a black and Pratt and Cole there early in January and everyone then described it as Pratt and Cole Dam. We stopped at Pratt and Cole Dam and I uh, looked through the scope and there were three um, noble ducks and you can see they were quite far away. There's a terrible photo. Um, and nothing gave me greater pleasure than just typing on the group, um, three noble ducks at uh, Pratt and Cole Dam knowing full well that it was an hour and 45 minutes for them to drive back from Feltriff. But from those that were in the car, I did hear that they dropped everything that they were doing and they drove like maniacs to get to see three knuckle ducks. So birders are very strange. 
I mean, this was um, a very interesting bird and, and, and Cliff and I agree that it's our best bird of the, the year in terms of the regional scarcity. Um, I was birding alone at Strunfontein and um, you can see in this long seeding grass um, on one of the, the, the tracks down to the S pans, um, a bird flushed in front of me and landed uh, fortunately in this tree. Um, and I managed to scramble out of my car and uh, my battery had run dead. I had to replace my battery and I, I photographed, uh, took this photograph, which you can see is not great. Um, but um, I immediately knew what it was. Well, I, I was confident that I knew what it was. Um, and I sent it to about 10 birders, but obviously my photo from the back of my camera was really poor because not one of my friends actually confirmed that it was a black eared sparrow lock. But fortunately, um, Jacques Malan was the first to, to get there and he took some better photographs. And it was an amazingly loyal bird to that little patch. I think probably 50 or 60 birders saw this bird. And it's, it was one of the two species during the year that was a new record for the city of Cape Town. So um, a bird that I was really proud of. So um, a great bird for the city. It's an endemic. It's highly nomadic, but uh, it was a great bird to find. And, and great that a lot of people got to see it. Um, even Simon Fogarty got to see it as well, which, <laughs> which was a tease when I say that Simon and I. I absolutely loved seeing you at the at the Twitch as, as quickly as you did. And this is one of the, this photo won the photo of the year award. This was a photo taken by me. Um, and it was a Cape Crow that uh, John Graham found um, just outside the town of the little town or settlement of Philadelphia. Um, and you can see that um, even birders get excited by a Cape Crow because uh, within a few minutes, there were some of the heavy hitters. Here's John. Um, showing uh, Michael Mason the, the 300. This was Michael Mason's 300 bird of the year, which, which is an incredible achievement. And he went on to see nine more bird species. Um, and this was the, the highlight of the year for me. I, I, as I said, I do a lot of running on the mountain and I, I had um, decided one morning to do a, a loop from uh, sort of Newlands Forest where the helicopters are up to the corner here where the turnstile is and then run the contour path all the way back into Kirstenbosch and then back down into Newlands Forest. And, um, I've been running that path for pretty much 30 years. Um, and it used to be a, a real feature of, of running up there that um, I would hear the song of an Eisner warbler, particularly in, in springtime. And, um, you know, probably six or seven years ago, I heard my last uh, Eisner warbler. And then um, I remember there was a gap of about two years. And then um, one of the birders in the city, Michael McSweeney, he um, recorded the song of a, a, a Eisner warbler on that path. And I remember going up five times to try and just hear it. And I never did. And that was four years ago. Um, and so it was a bird that we never expected. And um, my son and I used to talk about what bird do we want to, which is a bird I'd, we'd like to find the most. And I said to him, I'd, I'd love to hear a, an Eisner Warbler again in, in the city of Cape Town. And um, after about an hour of running, I turned a corner, uh, walking through a bit, of, we're running through a bit of a gully and I heard the, the, the distinctive um, song of a Nisner warbler. And I, my first thought was that there is a foreign birder who knows they used to occur here and he's playing the tape. And I came around the corner and I, I could tell the call was actually coming from up the slope. So I quickly recorded, recorded it with my panting breath and I um, then sent it to the group. And uh, I sent a message. I never thought I'd send this message ever again in the city of Cape Town. I've just recorded a Nisner warbler singing over here. And I dropped the pin. And this is what the habitat looks like. And those who have looked for Nisner warblers before will know that that's kind of where you're looking. Um, and I actually had uh, this impression that nobody would even try because it was quite a slog to get up there. But uh, within about an hour, um, John Graham went up there and managed to get this absolutely astonishing photo of a Nisner warbler. And what's even more astonishing is this is a young bird. You can see it's got the fleshy gape. And uh, it indicated immediately that not only was there an Eisner warbler in the city, but there was actually a pair and they were breeding and, and successfully breeding. Um, and, and I know that um, a lot of birders went up there and a lot of birders got to see their life for an Eisner warbler. Um, and so for me, it's, um, it's definitely the, the highlight of the challenge for me. And, and I think a lot of people really enjoyed the story of the rediscovery of, of an Eisner warbler in, in the city of Cape Town. I was up there about three weeks ago um, and during the late summer, they stopped singing. So they've got a very distinctive um, contact call and I heard them calling in the same place and I saw both male and female well that was a pair um, in, in, the, in the bushes and so we know that they're still there and we just hope they can breed and, and uh, establish the population a little bit more strongly than we thought they had. Okay so that was um, the uh, Nasla Warbler in November. Um, the very next day we went off to uh, Makassar with a bunch of friends 
Um, Garrett Skeed found the first Terex sandpiper of the challenge. Um, and that was pretty exciting because we knew that people had to drive from miles away to, to join us, but, uh, but they did and it stuck around for a while. Um, and then on the 7th of December, um, I was preparing for the um, Cape Bird Club end of year quiz. I had uh, roped in just about every birder in the city to, to join the quiz and participate. And literally half an hour before the quiz started, a record from Josh Oshlevsky at Makassar um, of Tibetan Sand Plover came through. Um, and I was very unpopular um, that the quiz was running. No one felt like they could run away to Makassar. Um, but fortunately, um, well, that bird disappeared. Yeah, no one sorry. could find it the next day. Um, and then about three weeks later, um, a second bird was found. Well, we assume it was a second bird. The first bird had a bit of breeding plumage in it. And the second bird was found on about the, in fact, very specifically on the 30th of December. Um, Dom found a blue cheek bee eater in Cape Point Nature Reserve, which was seen by, I think, one other birder. So typical bee eater um, sightings uh, in the city. And they disappear as fast as they appear. Um, and then obviously Ian's um, common miner. And then um, one of the great stories of the year um, it involves uh, two specific birds. Um, but um, Garrett found the Tibetan sand plover at Makassar again, and they were birding at Makassar. Um, and on the same day was a Cape Bird Club um, young bird is outing. So there's Penny in the background. And this is a very good friend of mine, Mark Nokia, with his two daughters, uh, Shella and Tana, who were on the um, Cape Bird Club young bird is outing on the 30th of December. And Mark, by his own admission, says that it was a miserable day to be birding. The wind was blowing a gale. Um, it was hot and dusty. And uh, he had committed to join the, the outing, but was questioning why he did so. Um, and uh, he's promised his girls ice creams and they're about to leave Strunfontein. Um, and I was actually in St. Francis Bay on holiday and I get uh, this message. Um, very nonchalantly, Mark posts a message, city turn on P2. Um, and so I phoned him immediately and I swore at him. Um, and he was so delighted and his girls will be delighted that they're featuring in this presentation and um, they will be delighted that they'll feature in the presentation on Thursday. Um, they were so excited and it was an amazing bird. So lots of birders rushed off, but that's not where it ended. Um, but there's um, a pick of mics um, showing the, the sooty turn against a, a greater crested turn. Um, the same morning, I received this message from Pete Ryan, um, was at the uh, Cork Bay Theater, 8 p.m. There were six Wilson Stormies um, feeding within five meters of the harbor wall maybe attracted by the anglers uh, fishing there. So I sent the message to the group. I said, received it from Pete this morning, maybe worth checking. And, and knowing storm petrels are highly pelagic birds, I said, I don't think there's any chance that they'll still be there. Um, and then Caden went uh, two hours later and storm petrels still here. Um, so they were identified as Wilson storm petrels. Um, and uh, he, he saw the Wilson storm petrels and then um, an hour later, Jacques Malone went and photographed this European storm petrel, which is a quite bizarre bird to see from land, and even more bizarre to see it so close to a harbour wall. So um, that's where they were. There's uh, the anglers, <laughs> and there are the birders. Um, it's the first, first time in history that birders have uh, uh, outnumbered uh, anglers, and um, it was uh, also some really cool young birders out there. Um, enjoying the spectacle, and there were just some amazing photographs. And this is where I had the most FOMO. We were in St. Francis, and we missed this whole, it was a festival, and it was such a great way for the challenge to end. We thought it was going to peter out, and on the second last day of the year, I think when people listed their highlight of the year, this was the thing that came up more than, than anything else. So here is um, uh, Zoe's amazing photo of the European Stormy. He has a picture from Michael just showing three birds lifting their wings simultaneously um, with those beautiful white flashes, just making the, the, the identification very straightforward. And um, he has the uh, photo of a Wilson storm petrel with those lovely yellow feet. And he has another picture of a European stormy um, from Zoe. And you can see obviously the Wilsons has the feet protruding at the, the end of the tail. Um, so an amazing experience for many birders who've never had the opportunity to go out at uh, sea. So that was the last bird that was added to the challenge list. Um, and uh, a quite amazing record for the city of Cape Town. And um, Cliff has kindly shared these photos. And um, what was uh, also of great interest was this young peregrine. Cliff, do you want to maybe just uh, talk us about talk to us about the, the peregrine falcon that was hunting storm petrels? Yeah, so, uh, it, it was really a phenomenon. It was so nice to just sit there and watch these storm petrels close up at a, a very stable base, which is not often what you get to do with storm petrels. Um, so it, it was a lovely opportunity, but it wasn't only the birders that were enjoying it. Um, 
we were leaving on the after the first afternoon we went down and we saw a peregrine chase a swallow, a barn swallow over the harbor. And then it uh, the, the barn swallow evaded it and the, the peregrine carried on and started harassing the storm petrels. And it, it took one. And then the next morning we went down when we took these photos and that's, that peregrine took three storm petrels within an hour and the one was two meters from us. So it was a really phenomenal, uh, but although quite sad <laughs> sight to see. And uh, Pete Ryan's actually written up a small little article for this for an upcoming uh, birds and uh, African, bird, African bird life. Yeah. Uh, but really interesting to see how, how uh, um, ad adaptive nature is. And, and these, this peregrine obviously took the opportunity with, with both talents. Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite um, interesting seeing Cliff posting uh, the message saying that there's a peregrine he's just taken three storm petrels so if you want to see them you better hurry so just an amazing way to end the year and these are amazing photographs and just shows how much uh, you get to see when you're birding in the city of cape town okay so what i'd like to do quickly is we we did a survey um i sent out a google form and we asked people to vote on on different categories and i'm just going to show some results um of the category so the first category was our uh, was our favorite national rarity and if you remember there were, were eight national rarities um, this is a ruddy turnstone, and this is obviously a pectoral sandpiper. This was at Strunfontein. There were quite a few pectoral sandpipers, but I thought this was quite a nice intro slide. Um, so those were the eight um, national rarities, uh, purple gallinule, euro, oik, bed sandpiper, peck sand, sooty tern, elegant tern, subantarctic shearwater, and Tibetan sand plover. And uh, we asked people to vote, and I've just picked the top five. So the pectoral sandpiper came in, in fifth place um, with, a, with about seven votes. Um, tied with the European oyster catcher. There were two European oyster catchers, one right at the beginning of the year, um, I think in, in the first week of January. And then there was one in October, um, which was the second one. And if any time you wanted to see a European oyster catcher in the city of Cape Town, you had to wait for me to leave the city of Cape Town and be completely somewhere else. So I missed both European oyster catchers and it was a very difficult bird. It was there for a day in, on both occasions and then disappeared. Um, and then Cliff, um, found the spared sandpiper um, in Cape Point um, on which beach? Olifant Sports. Yeah. Olifant Sports yeah. Beach. And bed sandpiper, as everyone knows, is an incredibly rare bird. Uh, we had one in the city a couple of years ago at Strunfontein, um, but this, this bird was incredibly obliging. Um, and it was so good to see it uh, as part of the challenge and, and came in, in third place as the, the third most popular national rarity. Um, and then uh, the city turn. Um, it might have been recency bias because it was uh, recorded on the 30th of December, but an incredibly rare bird in the city. And Cliff, when was the last uh, sooty turn? In, in the Western Cape, never in the city. Yeah, I think it was 2008, Elon's Bay Bird, I think we decided. So, so uh, an incredible record for the city. It was around for a day or two and then uh, it disappeared. Um, and into the new year, it was seen at uh, Part of Flay, not Part of Flay, at uh, Macassar, um, but it hasn't been seen since. So, uh, a great record. Um, and then um, the, this was a, a unanimous, well, not unanimous, it was an overwhelming vote. Um, so this was the garden of um, Rose and Charles, um, and they um, found this bird uh, in their garden. So this is the purple gallinule or American purple gallinule. And this is a bird that uh, Joburg birders definitely would have flown down for. Um, it uh, paraded around the garden. It was hard to get a photograph of this bird not walking on something man-made. Um, so a very unusual sighting. Um, absolutely incredible. I think it was such a community as well. And Rose and Charles joined the Cape Bird Club on the back of this. Um, they were so hospitable. And it was another part of the challenge, just seeing people um, coming together and enjoying great birds. So this is my very good friend, uh, Nick Fordyce. And um, this photo was posted on the group. Um, and his wording was over to you, Mike, which was basically a taunt um, because he knew full well that it was going to be very difficult for me to see the American purple gallinule because this is a map of South Africa or Southern Africa, and that's where the purple gallinule was. Um, and that's where Mike and Adam were. We were in Mozambique um, and uh, we were um, celebrating a different kind of bird. And I just had to put this in to make me feel better. We were seeing an olive headed weaver in the Panda Woodlands. Um, we flew back to Cape Town on the Saturday afternoon and we were in Rose's garden on the Sunday morning for a couple of hours. And the purple gallinule um, was unfortunately last seen on the Saturday. So I think Nick, might have put it in his bag. Um, we will have to just check for feather DNA. Right, and then we had regional rarities. Um, this is a European honey buzzard, which was photographed um, from my driveway, which is always very special. And um, that's the list of um, regional rarities. I'm not gonna go through each one. We're just gonna look at the top five. So the Blackhead Sparrowlock, Cliff and I had agreed that we, we had two of those five votes, <laughs> um, but uh, obviously people didn't think it was that special. 
um, then Giggy and Dennis's uh, red fell rope. There was a red fell rope in um, near Malmesbury in February. And a lot of Cape Town birders went to twitch that one, but it was outside the city of Cape Town. So it was really cool when one pitched up and, and uh, Giggy and, and Dennis were able to find it. Um, so Balon's Crake, um, this was another bird that was conveniently found um, while I was in Mozambique. Um, so we might check for Balon's Crake feather DNA in the next bag as well. Um, and then the Black Heron, this was a Western Cape bird for me. I'd never seen one in the Western Cape before. Um, it was first found at um, Strandfontein and then disappeared. And then it was found again at Marina de Gama and it became very reliable. We could go there in the evenings, it would come and roost with the little egrets and it was a, a really cool bird for everyone to catch up with as a, as a Western Cape bird or a city bird and it, it was very popular. We actually had two, a pair of them um, uh, earlier this year as well. So they seem to have um, definitely uh, spread out a little bit this year. Okay, and then um, those that are in this photograph will recognize it and we thought we were a very select group. So you can see mm -hmm. Uh, Cliff is on the left-hand side here with uh, Sarita. There's my son, Adam, and there's me. Simon was there. Of course, Simon was there. Nick Fordas was even there, which was unusual. But um, <laughs> this was a, an absolutely amazing discovery. Um, a non-birder was walking in uh, Cecilia Forest and sent a photo to Trevor of a, a bird that she didn't know what it was. And it was clearly not something that had ever been uh, contemplated. Um, we had decided to leave the Twitch because... Uh, it hadn't appeared and we uh, were down at the car park and Cliff typed the XYZ bird is here and I had to run up the hill. That's me running up the hill, frantically trying to make sure I got it. And uh, there was the most popular regional rarity, which was this sub-adult um, Narina Trogan. Um, it was seen on that day and um, it then disappeared for about a month. And then it was found in the Elfin Green Belt uh, about, uh, yeah, about a month later and, and then it was very obliging and just... Mm -hmm a ton of birders got to see it and it created such a, a vibe and non-birders were going to go look at this amazing Marina Trogan. It hasn't been seen since, it was around for about three or four days and then I'm sure it's somewhere in the system but just very hard to find them. And then um, favorite endemic species, this is the amazing forest buzzard that was so obliging early in the year. Um, and uh, these we've spoken about, most of them already, he has this uh, famed wolf button quail. Ground woodpecker was a very hard bird to find um, I, I saw them a couple of times in Silver Mine, and Cape Point was a good site, and I actually saw one at um, uh, Solaris, but it, it was a difficult bird, and some people waited for very, the very last minute to find one. Um, and then Nars and the Warbler obviously took some, some votes. Um, and then um, any presentation that I do to anyone and anywhere has to include this bird. This is Solaris Pass. This is uh, myself with a good friend and, and recent Zoe. This was during Birding Big Day. Um, we were um, doing Solaris Pass, which seems like an odd thing to do, but the reason we were doing Solaris Pass is we had to get a Cape Rock jumper on our Burning Big Day uh, list, and we, we were delighted to do so. Um, and then the, the winner of the, the favorite endemic is the Black Harrier, um, and I don't think there's any argument there. It's, a, it's, it's such a special bird. It's so iconic, um, and it, it really is in, in, uh, in danger of, of disappearing because of uh, a number of threats, habitat loss and wind farms. So, um, and it wasn't an easy bird. There was a pair at Silver Swim's front and then there were a couple of other birds around the city, um, but you had to be lucky to see it. And the more time you spent at Silver Swim's front, the better. And then um, these are the, um, the favorite places. We, we had a, this is a beautiful Clip Springer Trail um, near Cool Bay um, on Clarence Drive um, near uh, Gordon's Bay. Um, and um, this is just a quick indication I'm running through this. These were the, the places that we asked people to vote on. So um, I'm just going to spin through them and it just gives you an idea of how many places we went to and went birding. Um, and this doesn't even come close to, to showing all the places that were available. So a lot of parks and gardens and just uh, sort of open areas, um, just some incredible birds. We haven't even put Pratt and Cole down there, which is uh, somewhere here just east of uh, Philadelphia, but some amazing places we asked people to vote. And these were the results. So Cape Point, just such a beautiful place. This is the map showing where people logged species, obviously dominated by the roads, um, but uh, amazing views, going to do a sea watch there on a winter's morning is such a special thing to do. There, there's that photo again. Um, and then uh, this is on the other side, on the Biffles Bay side, which was much better in the southeastern conditions, but it doesn't show it, but that uh, was a very, very windy and miserable morning, but great for uh, pelagic birds. Uh, we had a black-browed albatross that was basically just off the rocks, which was uh, very unusual. 
I mean, these were some of the special birds, the ground woodpecker again, and there's a, a resident uh, Cape starling, um, which uh, proved elusive at the beginning of the year, but was eventually found. And most people got to see it, but uh, it could be quite tricky. This is a, um, sorry, I didn't credit uh, John Graham on the Cape starling photo, my apologies for that. Um, and then Silverstrom Strunk came in second. So this is a beautiful piece of strunk felt on the West Coast. And it's an area that um, we, we kind of discovered had a lot of the species that you'd go to West Coast National Park for, but yet they're here right, right in the boundaries of our city. That's, that's kind of what it looks like on a gloomy morning. Um, in the springtime, there's beautiful flowers. That's the Silverstrunk Silver Strunk Resort. And just some amazing birds, uh, great tits. Karoo thrush was, was a bird we, we battled for and then they were kind of quite common. Um, we had an amazing experience with a, a few Cape Pendulum tip nests um, and then Cape Bunting and Nails Warbler. Those were birds that we would see at Silverstrom Strunt. Um, and then Solari's Pass was uh, certainly my vote for the favorite spot. Um, you know, it's just such an iconic birding um, sp spot. And this is um, up by the, the cannons. This is where you want to see a rock jumper. This is a group we went with on a Cape Bird Club outing and we were all looking at um, the rock jumpers. And this is a, just shows the diversity of people that went birding this year in groups and uh, it was really nice to see. And that's trying to get a sight of a Victorin's warbler, which is very tricky, um, but eventually they, they do pop out. And Nicholson's pipit was a good bird that we found at Solaris. And there's the, the uh, <laughs> you can never have too many photos of a Cape Rock jumper <laughs> at a presentation. Ground woodpecker and, and familiar chat. And then uh, Marmre, this was, uh, this was, Cliff knew well about the, the Moravian church in Marmre but uh, I'd never been there before. And it was just such a wonderful place. This this Moravian church and uh, the pastor there got to know all of us. Um, we would pop him a message and say, can we come and bird in the gardens and in the woodland? And that's what the woodland looks like. It's a little oasis amongst the, 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 the wheatlands, the wheat fields of the Swatland. Um, and so a lot of birds congregated here, honey guards and olive woodpeckers. And there was a brown snake eagle lurking around there for quite a lot of the year, um, a bird that I did not find. Um, and just some of the iconic species from there, the hoopoos were common, pearl-breasted swallows, um, pied starlings, um, and wattle starlings uh, were, were tricky, but if you wanted to see them, you'd go off to Marmre. Cape clapper larks displaying in, in, um, in springtime, and then some non-bird uh, excitement. This was a life for me, a common pup lurper. I sent it to Cliff just to make sure my ID was correct. And then the favorite uh, location was, uh, unsurprisingly, Strunfontein. So that uh, just shows how much time people spent uh, birding in Strunfontein and a number of dots there. Um, but just a beautiful place. This is the one pan S7, uh, uh, S8, um, which flooded during winter. And then as it dried out, um, it just attracted the most amazing collection of birds. This is where the red phalarope was. There was a pair of pectoral sandpipers. We had our only marsh sandpipers at the site. Mm -hmm. We had lesser flamingos. Um, we just had incredible birds just at the site. But uh, once summer came along, it dried out completely and it was a bit of a mud flat after that. So um, just uh, the, the changing nature of, of Strunfontein is incredible. It remains one of the best birding spots in the country and the challenge was no different. It was really incredible. Um, some of the special birds, there's Matt's um, red knot, um, there's the uh, lesser striped swallow. And um, on one of the most powerful storms in, in living memory, um, no one was birding except for Trevor. Um, he was parking his car at, uh, at Strunfontein waiting for um, something to happen. And he um, sent out a message of an Arctic tern um, in, a, in a tern roost. It, was, it wasn't really a roost. They weren't roosting because the wind was blowing them so hard. And we rushed down and we had amazing views of this beautiful Arctic tern. And it's really nice to see them in comparison to the common terns and just see the body shape difference. And it was really nice to see them uh, close by and, and not on a ship when you're bouncing around and, and where you normally see an Arctic turn. So an amazing find for, for Strunfontein. And then there's obviously the, the black heron and a, a really cool photo of Michael showing the, the different um, black heron and, and little egrets. Um, and uh, then just very quickly, I know I'm running um, tight with time, it's eight o'clock. Um, these were the birds that uh, we've now seen in um, 2024 that we did not see in the challenge. So we never had a Western Osprey and Mike Mason um, was at uh, Macassar on, on the 1st of January at 10 o'clock in the morning because he obviously went to bed early because he stopped birding at 6 o'clock the, the day before. Um, and he got the uh, Western Osprey. And it, it's a bird we surprised we never see in the city, but we just don't. So a, a great record. Mm -hmm. Then um, the American Golden Plover found at um, Cape Point. Um, we had an Abton stalk um, in Clavelli, um, which, was, which was a great bird uh, to get 
Um, I was uh, fortunately close by and I managed to get there quickly. And uh, Adam, my son, took this really cool photo of this abdomen stalk looking through its legs. Um, and then we had a lesser gray shrike, um, which was found by one of the birders who I think was out birding because he got involved in the, in the, um, the, the city challenge. Um, and then uh, the most bizarre um, occurrence of the red-footed booby, which um, was seen earlier that day up the West Coast. Um, and uh, Trevor was on a pelagic trip um, uh, with clients and they were on their way back into Heart Bay. And remarkably, this red-footed booby flew past the boat and flew around the boat multiple times and, and just the most incredible experience. So that was another bird not seen uh, last year, which is not surprising. And then we had a red-tailed tropic bird. There's a bird that floats around in the peninsula um, flying over Strunfontein uh, last Wednesday, I think. Um, and then uh, we had uh, Franklin skull. This was probably the bird that we were most surprised we didn't have. That's in Western yellow wagtail. Um, but finally a Franklin skull pitched up um, on Friday last week and a lot of birders went to go enjoy that. So that uh, is a quick run through. Um, I'm sorry I've uh, rushed it a little bit, um, but I just want to quickly hand over to Cliff to wrap it up and, and just talk about the benefits of the challenge uh, to the city of Cape Town and, and its biodiversity unit. Oh, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, um, very quickly, I'll just say, so there's actually been huge benefits to the city um, and particularly the biodiversity management branch and the environmental management department. Um, when, I mean, really credit is to you, you said you wanted to do a birding activity for the 75th, and uh, so really it was, you were champion, you really championed it right through, and it was only me saying, oh, let's limit it, let's do the city boundaries, because it was something I've been thinking of for a while, is, is trying to really promote birding in the city, um, and we really, birding is such a wonderful, sustainable, and compatible activity with the diversity of other Activity. So we really are keen to promote it as a sustainable, sustainable activity on our, on our nature reserves. Um, and that's for, for the visitors and the public, but also for the staff um, and the people that work on the reserve to see, oh, wow, birders are coming to my site and they're enjoying it. So Wolfgart Nature Reserve um, brought in a lot of birders for the, uh, the European bee eaters, which was a, a, a firm favorite with a lot of the challenges. And when they were there, um, the People and Conservation Officer there, Jerome September, was great, and he took them into the reserve where they saw other birds and other wonderful biodiversity in a reserve that people didn't know existed, a little Wolfgart Nature Reserve on the, on the Balls Bay coastline. And when we were there, with, we, we took our director out one afternoon to show the uh, Lorraine Garrens to show her the, uh, the European beaters and our, our manager, Julia Wood. And we found a, um, a spider orchid, Bolothiana um, elithiae. And um, that is the was the first time uh, that species has been recorded on the lowlands. And it's actually the first time I've ever seen it, uh, despite years of looking for it. And uh, it just shows you when you get people out into the field and drawing biodiversity, you find lots of other things. So really promoting by uh, uh, birding as a sustainable and, and uh, sort of a core activity on our reserves and our particular areas is something we really wanted to achieve. And I think we, we really have. Um, very, very, very exciting. We had over 30 city staff member partic members participating in the event. There in the bottom of the, the screen is a group of them and one of our outings. Um, and so we had from uh, junior staff and EPWP uh, workers up to our head of operations, uh, Roy, um, head of conservation, Roy Ernston. We had a great diversity of staff joining in the challenge and really getting involved. And there was quite a bit of competition between the guys, which was really nice to see. And I, I think we've, we've got, created quite a few more birdies within the branch, which is great. Um, and as mentioned, we encouraged people to visit nature reserves and other natural spaces in the city of Cape Town they wouldn't have done um, otherwise. Even Tigerberg Nature Reserve, which is a wonderful reserve. A lot of people went there for the first time to look for the Blue Mountain Flycatcher. And that was great. I saw a lot of people there and, and the, the gate staff were like, wow, we're getting so many more birders and, and visitors. Uh, so really, that was great to see. Um, and. And these presentations, the whole birding big year has been a lovely opportunity to showcase not only Cape Town special birds, but our special biodiversity and our protected areas. Um, and uh, the more people that know about them, support them and use them, the more likely we are to protect them into the future. So uh, really, really happy with all the support and, and people using our reserves, and I'm sure we'll continue with it. And what's so great is Henk has actually created the city of Cape Town as, a re as an area on bird lesson. 
So people can maintain the city bird lists. We can still keep the group going, which, which Mike mentioned earlier, the WhatsApp group. So that culture and community of birding um, uh, for Cape Town has been established, which is a massive, uh, wonderful um, achievement and, and something I think we can be very happy with. Um, and birding has always been, but is, I think is becoming more of a key activity for our various people and conservation programs. So we have people on the reserves that are saying this is a wonderful avenue to excite children, to get people involved. People like Penny from the committee has been great in supporting and the bird club is donating binoculars and, and books and all of those uh, good things. Um, and the data we've received. So the data is going to be used. It's hugely valuable. It's a lot. Uh, we need to clean it up a bit. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, uh, especially the threatened species and the introduced species um, to overlay, the, overlay those of our protected area network, see where the threatened species are. Are they being captured by a protected area network? Are they in those, um, those critical areas we need to conserve? And uh, that's a lovely informant. And uh, our GIS analyst, um, uh, JJ Bell, has already been playing with some of the data. And we're looking 38% of the records were on uh, protected areas oh, within wow. the city of Cape Town. So 38% uh, of that 250,000. Um, and 28% were on city nature reserves. So that's quite significant if you think so many people log birds in their gardens and on roadsides and all over. So it's a really high percentage, um, which we were quite proud of. Um, so yeah, I really, uh, and just again to thank Mike for driving it. He was a real champion. It's been great. And uh, from the city side, we really like to thank all the people that participated and the wonderful camaraderie and, and goodwill that, that was achieved. This last photo. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. At, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is one of our outings. Um, our branch manager agreed we could do four outings with the, with the people that signed up to do the challenge, but you had to sign up to do the challenge, <laughs> otherwise you couldn't come. <laughs> and uh, many of these people, it was the first time they'd ever been to Gerstenbosch Gardens. They lived in Cape Town their entire lives. They had not been to Gerstenbosch Gardens before. So it's just wonderful to expose people to different areas. Um, and Gerstenbosch are great. They allowed us free access. Um, and we spent a lovely morning uh, walking around and, and and logging some famous birds, which these people, a lot of the people on the Cape Blackstone see. So sugar birds and oranges and sunbirds. And so really lovely opportunity. Thanks very much, Cliff. Um, yeah, and I think um, that wraps it up. I apologize to all of those that are hanging on. We're running a bit late. Um, but uh, just to say thank you to everyone for, for listening. Um, and a big thank you to all the people that participated. It was an absolute blast. It was uh, much better than we ever expected. Um, and I will formally now lay down a challenge to all the other cities within South Africa um, to try and beat our number of 324. But just remember, it's not a competition. It's really just to get people out and get, out, get them birding and enjoying this amazing thing that we, we have, uh, have on our doorstep. So thank you very much. Um, Christina, over to you. I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, well, thanks very much, Mike and Cliff. That was an amazing presentation and brought back some some good memories and also some uh, uh, sad ones of things that I dipped on or <laughs> missed out on. But no, it was was a brilliant presentation, um, and I really love the fact that it's it's contributing to conservation and providing so much data for the city. So well done to both of you for, for driving that and well done to all the participants for, uh, for participating. Um, so there um, aren't that many questions. We'll keep, it, um, we'll keep questions short because we don't want to yeah. keep people too much longer. So I promise you exactly. we'll answer very quickly. Yeah, so um, Ted Vermeulen um, asks, whether any of this will prevent development at Princess Flay and other wetlands. So Cliff, maybe you could yeah, answer that. So, so not particularly. Um, luckily, Princess Flay is a signed up biodiversity agreement site. So between a recreation and parks department to manage a site and Cape Nature, there's an agreement in place. But um, anything that is not safe, that might be threatened by development, uh, if people know about it, they will be able to comment during the processes. There's always commenting processes. And, and that's one of the big valuable things of, of, of people knowing these sites and having an understanding. Um, and for me, one of the 
the most exciting areas in the city and, and something I'm really uh, excited about is Makassar. And, and the more people that are, go to the Makassar East area, uh, it's going to be a beautiful reserve of 500 hectares into the future. And, and we, we're really glad that people are getting exposed to them. So not specifically, but it, it certainly helps. Uh, the data helps and getting people to know and, and visit the sites really does help. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was one of the, the big things of this challenge was getting people out there, which was great. Um, yeah, there's not really any more questions. Um, I guess right. this is this is more tongue in cheek, but it applies to a lot of a lot of birders. Marty Jasper asks, I'm interested, what is Mike Mason's day, day job? <laughs> we, all, we all wonder, we all wonder yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I wonder about a few no, people Mike, are always Mike's out a, there. <laughs> Mike, Mike is, um, yeah, he's, uh, he, he, he really does, um, he works very hard, but uh, he also birds very hard. So he gets out on the weekends. Um, yes. And it's, it's great to have a champion like him. He takes amazing photographs. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I know there was a joke going around that Strandfontein was his office. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I just wanted to say in the chat, there's um, a couple of bird clubs that seem to have taken up your, yes. your challenge, Mike. So yes, um, yes, Etiquini yes. will take up the challenge on our 75th anniversary year and uh, BirdLife Lofelt is arranging a challenge for their 40th celebration next year. So that's great. So that get as many seabirds as we got. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and this is that a really, really big story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one of those. Thank you very much for storms. grabbing us. Um, I, I know it was uh, arranged a long time ago, and um, we, we were very excited to present. And uh, I, I hope it was uh, interesting and, and um, yeah, informative. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really enjoyed it, and it seems like from the messages, the audience did as well. So um, before we close, I just want to remind everyone that we'll be back again in two weeks' time. And we will be hearing from the CEO of BirdLife International, Martin Harper, who will be sharing some of the amazing conservation stories from around the world being uh, spearheaded by BirdLife International. So please do join us uh, for that in two weeks time. And uh, with that, I will just say thanks again to Mike and Cliff and uh, thanks to our audience. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in two weeks time. Good night. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Cheers.